Hello, and welcome to an Oscars edition of Spotlight Live on Curious Stardust, a blog where scientists share an insider look into astrophysics, nanoscience, and neuroscience. I'm Heather Sparks, and today we'll be discussing the science in this year's Oscars. The Academy Awards are this Sunday, and for the first time ever, not one but two Best Picture nominees are the lives and works of famous scientists. The Imitation Game tells the tale of British cryptanalyst and mathematician Alan Turing, who famously cracked the secret codes of Germany's Enigma machine, helping put a more swift end to World War II. The Theory of Everything outlines the theories and ideas set forth by Stephen Hawking, work that shed light on the beginning of the universe and our place in it. Finally, Interstellar, up for several visual effects of words, is a well-researched, if not plausible, story of intergalactic space travel. But how much of these films represent the real science that made these stories possible? What exactly did the mathematicians and logicians like Alan Turing do at Bletchley Park in England? And what is it about Stephen Hawking's theories that are so revolutionary? And what does it tell us about black holes and time? And as we saw in Interstellar, is it really possible to travel through a wormhole to faraway galaxies and actually survive? To answer these questions and more, we sent three Kavli scientists and our Curious Stardust bloggers into the theaters and asked them to illuminate us. So if you have any questions, send them our way using the hashtag OscarScience on Twitter or Google+. So today, uh, joining us is Mandeep Gill, He's an observational cosmologist from the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology at Stanford. Hi. <laughs> um, Katie McGill, she's a doctoral candidate studying two-dimensional nanomaterials and joins us from Ka the Kavli Institute at Cornell for Nanoscale Science. And finally, Sean Escala is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Center for Theoretical Neuroscience from the Kavli Institute for brain science at the Columbia University. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you, Heather. Happy to be here. Great, yeah. great. Good to see you. Okay, so um, I'd like to start with the imitation game, um, just because it's it starts chronic. Uh, it's the first film starting chronologically uh, in history. So, Sean, as someone with a statistics background like yourself. Why is it so challenging to break, break a secret code, and especially the ones used by the Germans during World War II? Well, it really comes down to a numbers game, as they allude to in the movie. Um, uh, the, the way that um, cryptographers encrypt messages is actually, uh, it, it actually pretty simple, at least how it's, it's typically been done. You just have a substitution. You have some set of letters, you know, one, you know A through Z, that you want to switch the, the identity of. So you're going to substitute you know, Q for S and R for Y or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, if, you, if you have an order of number of letters that you're going to use as the, that, that tells you what the offset between the encoded letter and the outcoded letter should be, then uh, that's how you do cryptography. So you just, if you, if you want to encrypt a, and you have B as the letter you're going to use to encrypt it with, then that means you should add 2, because B is a value 2, to the letter A. And so A would be encrypted to C in that case. So then the total number of ways that you can encrypt a message has to do with how long this string of letters that you use to encode some other um, messages. And uh, it turns out that in Enigma, because of the total number of settings in the, in the, in the machine, the, the length of that string could be massive. And you get a, this combinatorial explosion, where every time you have another letter in your se sequence, you basically multiply the total number of possibilities by 26. And that, then there are some other technical details. But, um, and 20, so very, 26 is B from the alphabet, right? That's right, because of the right. number of letters in the alphabet. So, so very quickly, you get numbers that are really massive. And um, so when it comes down to trying to break a code like that, you have to um, figure out all of the different possible ways that the message could have been encoded in the first place. Mm -hmm. And frankly, uh, you don't. You simply, as they as they mentioned the, in the in the um, in the movie, you simply don't have time to test every possibility. Um, 
there's actually not that much difference now in the 21st century from from then in terms of that. Like the the sheer number of, you know, 159 million 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 is probably more than our fastest computers could do as well. Mm -hmm. um, but what it turns out is that the Germans made mistakes. Mm -hmm. so they, they didn't just encrypt their messages totally randomly, um, which is the correct way to do it, in which case then the code would be unbreakable. They made certain errors that, that are not so obvious. They're kind of subtle initially. But those errors um, uh, result in certain statistical regularities in the mm -hmm. encrypted message. And so if you can identify what those statistical irregularities are, then that massively reduces the number of possible combinations that could have been used to encrypt the message. Right. Then and instead was, of having to, sorry, go ahead. And was that seen um, like in the greetings and closings of their messages? Is that well, what? Yeah, so that was one of the things that they identified. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, um, you know, the, the movie has a bunch, takes some liberty with history. Um, sure. And, uh, and it presents it as if Turing did all this um, from scratch. But actually, the, um, the Polish Secret Service um, had been decrypting uh, German Enigma messages for a while. And they were one of the first to recognize the Germans were making mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, for example, they would put um, the same three letters at the beginning of every message uh, twice. The same three letters twice. So three letters followed by the same three letters. Uh -huh. And if you so that meant that there was going to be a connection between the first letter and the fourth letter, the second uh -huh. and the fifth, and the third and the sixth. And so just from that knowledge, they could then massively reduce the number of te uh, of of um, possibilities. And then in the movie, they use an interesting uh, um, example. I, I don't know if this is true. It very well may have been that um, the phrase "Heil Hitler" was a commonly used phrase. Right. So they looked for the the occurrence of of of, of in encrypted messages that could could um, that could have you know resulted from that phrase, and then they were able to further reduce the number of possibilities they had to search over. So why were why was um, someone like Turing, a mathematician, um, picked to lead the code breaking team, and and why was the crossword puzzle useful in um, testing the abilities of potential teammates? What, what's the connection there? Well. Um, I think the two are not necessarily immediately related and, and mm -hmm. might not actually always coexist in the same person. The movie portrays it that it does co did coexist in Turing and also in Miss Clark. Um, but uh, uh, having a mathematician is extremely important because the, the, the goal of this kind of cryptanalysis is to develop algorithms that can exploit statistical regularity. Mm -hmm. and, and you need to have a, a very fundamental um, knowledge of how statistical irregularities could arise in order to be able to um, come up with potential algorithms to exploit this. So that, so that's really why Turing and his colleagues were brought on board. The the crossword puzzle thing I think has to do with more the art and the voodoo of crypt crypto analysis than the than the hard science. So as we were saying before, um, words like Heil Hitler or the the first phrase in a, in a sequence or I think they they started in the in the movie they they talked about how the weather report had every morning at 6 a.m. had certain words that they knew were going to be in it. That's more like when you're doing a crossword puzzle and people who just sort of have good intuitive senses with language and and puzzles might have good guesses of of words. They they call them cribs, just like we say a crib sheet, like a cheat sheet, right? When you're mm -hmm. when you're trying to um, pass a test, um, you know, <laughs> and not following the rules. Um, in this case. <laughs> uh, Crypt could help uh, um, could help uh, 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 the allies break the German codes. Mm -hmm. So having good guesses ended up also being important. So every morning when they had to guess the the um, the settings for the Enigma, they needed um, uh, they needed to come up with uh, possible cribs to allow them to do so. Okay. So how was um, so how exactly was uh, Turing's machine built and able to break that code? I mean. It just kind of seemed in the movie that he built this machine and he knew exactly how it was going to work, but how did it do that? Do you have any insights on that? So um, I, I, I must admit that I haven't gone through the technical details of the, of, of the design of the machine, but my understanding is that it was one of the first um, examples of something that we take for granted now all the time, which is the ability to program a machine to, do, to, to follow an algorithm. So it could search through this space of possible uh, ways to encrypt a message in an automated way based on some things that you kind of told it about how to search. 
So by following this program and doing it in an automated way and doing and checking each possibility much quicker than any human ever could, you were sort of able to uh, um, tackle this combinatorial, combinatorially uh, expensive and complicated problem. Right. Okay. So um, you know, Turing is credited um, besides. Um, cutting a couple years off of World War II with his work and his teammates' work. Um, he's also um, considered the father of, the com of computer science. Um, now, the movie didn't really talk about that much, but I do want to talk a little bit about that with you guys. Um, uh, Mandeep and Katie, let me pull you guys in to this conversation. Um, it seems like all of you um, work with computers these days um, just to make sense of such massive amounts of data. Um, you know, s can you imagine uh, doing your work without a computer? Um, and how has that work, you know, how has computers changed your field um, over the past several decades? You know, it's kind of funny to hear you um, ask, how would you do your work without your computer? Because that's actually something I've thought about before. How did my advisor do his graduate work? You know, you kind of wonder how people got anything done. <laughs> um, and not just from the massive amounts of data that it can take and you can process and do all the statistics on really easily, but also um, kind of the more day-to-day -day of just looking up papers is so much easier. We don't have to go to the library and send in our request to the librarian and wait for the physical copy anymore. We can just get online and look it up and get that information immediately. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of incredible to even try and imagine doing research before computers. Yeah, um, that's definitely true. I mean, it, it brings up <clears throat> for me that... <clears throat> You know, the particle physicists built the web at CERN. You know, it was, the internet was there, uh, the sort of text-based part, but the web itself came out of uh, particle physicists needing to share a lot of visual data and stay connected all the time and, and many things. So, uh, we yeah, they're very sort of integral to everything we do. So, in my field of astro astrophysics, a lot of people use simulations. Uh, you can't, uh, you know, see things happen that take hundreds of millions of years out in space. We don't live long enough, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> so we, people started building these big simulations in the 70s and 80s, uh, and now you know, we can do amazing things with them. So it, it's just integral, like, like Katie said, in all ways. You know, not that I like computers all the time. Sometimes they bug, me, they bug everybody, but uh, they are pretty uh, critical to everything we do. I'm going to keep uh, finishing my popcorn. If that's OK, so I'm just getting everything. <laughs> <laughs> Mindy, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned CERN and that, that made me think of just the scale of experiments that we do there and how they're collecting terabytes of data. I don't know the ridiculous amounts of data that they collect every time they do a run and it just would be impossible to try and even think about analyzing it if we didn't have computers and, and let alone recording it. I mean, there's such an integral part to those experiments that they really wouldn't be possible without the invention of the computer. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, what I've read of during, in the years after, <clears throat> after the war, like Sean pointed out, that was one of the first programmable machines, the, the rotors and how they picked out the different codes and um, things like that. Um, but afterwards, you did a lot of both theoretical and uh, work on actual machines to, that really did lay a lot of the groundwork for generally programmable machines uh, that we use now. I actually knew them mostly for the Turing test, uh, you know, which is how you could tell a computer apart from a human before. But I, I'm pretty impressed that we know so much more about him now after this movie. Right, right. Um, I'd love to speak more about Turing. I could talk about the movie and the Turing machine for probably at least 30 more minutes. But let's move on to um, another Oscar nominee, The Theory of Everything. Uh, Mandy, you, let's just keep rolling with you for a minute. I hate to interrupt your popcorn time, but um, right. one of the scenes shows Hawking's professor demanding that he, um, that he find the mathematical formula that proves one of his ideas, okay? So could you explain what the role of math is when it comes to understanding the universe? And if you were explaining to a third grader, um, can you explain what the theory of everything looks like? This is... Um more questions. So how would I, let's say, uh, I would begin by saying, you know, when I was 16 taking physics for the first time, 
we come across this equation that relates uh, how high something is when, you're, when you drop something to how long it takes to hit the ground. And I went out and tested it on a bridge. I would drop rocks. And I was like, this is kind of amazing. This worked. And little squiggles on paper. There's a really great uh, paper right. by Wiener. Uh, you, can actually, you can actually predict how long it's going to take something to fall off a bridge or where it might fall or, or that kind of thing. It's actually, it actually works every time. Yeah, and this started with, you know, the, the uh, Greeks did a lot of, sort of the theoretical uh, geometry and things like this, but really, you know, with Newton and, and around that time when we started doing that, and now we've built up this huge, uh, beyond celestial mechanics, we just have a huge body of knowledge of how things work, uh, the four forces and things like things like that, and we, we use the language of math, and we, that's how we build, you know, we observe things, but we build sort of connections between all the things we observe and the regularities through math, and it works. The, the paper I was about to explain, uh, express was uh, Wigner's paper, um, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics, and it's just, it's crazy in a way that that's the language of the, uni of the universe, but it is what we use, and, and uh, you know, Einstein has said similar things, so it's what uh, how we understand the world. Now, your question of how would you explain to a third grader the theory of everything, I'm not sure I could get into that right now. <laughs> uh, like, it, we don't have a theory of, of everything. There's, it's, it's interesting what our drive is towards that. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we have four forces that we know about. We've combined two of them very well into a force called the electroweak force. And, and the best analogy for that is electromagnetism originally. They, electricity and magnetism were seen to be very different in the 1800s until uh, sort of Maxwell and then Einstein really saw that when you move fast, uh, this stationary charge can be interpreted as magnetism because it looks like it's moving. Anyway, he combined them into electromagnetism through equations, and that was just the model. So it looks like we can continue doing that with the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force that hold the nuclei together. The ultimate idea would be something like string theory that would combine gravity in it. And of course, mm -hmm. we're very far from observationally being able to verify any of that. So um, so I, I want to make that clear. I, and I'm only going to speak for myself. I'm an observationalist, so I care about what we can measure, what we know. And we have a very clear sense of that. It may, there's beautiful math, both within all the stuff we know and outside of that. Uh, string theory and other things where it would be great if we could do quantum gravity that would combine all the, the forces together in different ways. But we we can only know the stuff that we can go out and test uh, up to. And so right, that's right. Really very important. So, so with it, the, yeah. Okay, go oh, ahead. Sorry, I had a just a response to build on some of Mandeep's comments about um, it, it just made me think of how math and physics have sort of tracked each other historically. Um, I mean, from a really simple example of the idea of imaginary numbers in mathematics, which has been incredibly important to the development of electronics and how we um, deal with electronic components. Um, but even scaling up, and Mandeep was mentioning, you know, the space of observational astrophysics versus um, what theory can do. And there's a lot of complicated math that goes into those theories, but at the same time, it's the math that allows us to pull out predictions and see if they match up with observations. And so. I don't know, I sort of view it as there's a big, like, kind of a tug of war, or not in a bad way, though, sort of a mutual, mutually helpful tug of war back and forth between math and physics sometimes. Right, right. Mandeep, you were saying that um, for physicists, mathematics is your language. Um, and there's a point, um, there's a part of, you know, we just talked about it where, you know, the professor is demanding that Hawking um, makes makes a formula to, to actually prove what he's thinking about. Um, uh, but further, or I think it's before then, um, when he, that Hawking comes to this point where he goes to see Roger Penrose, another famous physicist, uh, who talks about um, space-time singularity at the center of black holes, where space and time converge. Um, I believe that's what a space-time singularity is. Um, but then, a little, you know, several decades later, um, I'm sorry, Hawking is actually inspired after the Penrose, um, the Penrose uh, lecture 
to think about the same singularity and then go back and he's thinking that he can actually talk about the, the beginning of time um, using the same formula that Penrose put forth. Um, however, then he, a couple decades later, re Hawking reverses his, uh, his theory. So I'm wondering if there's any way to um, explain to me <laughs> and people like me, uh, you know, what happened there? When um, what what happened with um, Hawking's first idea that there's a singular at the beginning of time, singularity at the beginning of the time, and then he reverses it to think that actually there was no beginning of time. <laughs> um, I'm going to fess up right here and say I uh, uh, I tried to do some of the homework after the movie and read up on Penrose and, and the theorems, and uh, you know you there are uh, you know, general it's a deep uh, which is Einstein's theory of gravity. Uh, lots of textbooks and things that will go into this, but uh, this you would need to ask a theorist to get uh, the most accurate answer because none of that stuff is testable. I'm going to go back to that. Right. Uh, we go back to um, our, so Einsteinian gravity breaks down at around the Planck length or when energy gets. It. Um, when stuff gets too energetic. We don't deal with infinities, and a singularity is infinity. So everything in the universe, there's only finite mass, finite energy, that's the things that we deal with. And that's a that's a, actually a basic part of quantum theory, and it's called renormalizability. You don't, infinities crop up, and you need to kind of, well, let's say sweep them under the rug. We don't fully even understand it yet, but you have to understand how to sweep them under. And, and those two areas, general relativity, and quantum theory are, are, are separate. And that's why people are always looking for quantum gravity. General relativity is a classical theory. You can, in theory, see things like infinities. And we just know that you don't in, in the real world. And so we're going to have to go, and you know, people work theoretically very hard on this. You know, they, yes, you, uh, there was this idea that there was a singularity. That's why interstellar, which we'll talk about, is you know, they, they're, they don't know what happens inside a black hole, right? Is there a naked singularity? Right. They call it at the at the center of a black hole for a non-rotating black hole or not. Um, we don't know, and we're going to have to get observational tests to find out. So um, if, if others have a better answer, uh, go ahead. <laughs> um, I guess uh, on my brief review as well, because as a nanoscientist, uh, GR is not my specialty. But um, GR, it, GR for the uh, non-scientists out there is general oh, relativity. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. <laughs> That's <relativity>. okay. <laughs> um, yeah, but the way I sort of understood Hawking's later work is is sort of talking about you know the beginning of the universe and historically before he um, wrote that paper, there were sort of two ways you could think about the universe. One is that it's existed forever. Um, that was just proven a long time ago because uh, we can observe stars in the night sky. If the universe had existed for an infinite amount of time before now, then all of the light from all of the stars in the universe would reach us and the night sky would be completely bright. And so it's easy to kind of discount that version of how the universe operates. Um, mm -hmm. And so then the other option is that, you know, there's a definite starting point and, um, but that would require that we sort of know the initial conditions and, you know, it's kind of set and then it expands from there. And uh, Hawking's idea, as I understand it, is in bringing quantum mechanics into the equation, quantum mechanics deals with probabilities. How likely is it that something is going to happen? And that means that there's a, another option for kind of the, the beginning of the universe, which I will kind of use in quotes because that's sort of how he talks about it in um, A Brief History of Time, that um, you, you don't have to know what the initial universe looked like. It, you can have all these different possibilities and what you really care about is what's the most likely thing to happen and then you know we can be all egocentric and say and well you know hopefully the most likely thing to happen includes the existence of human beings like us <laughs> so that um, we don't you know disappear into the mathematical void <laughs> in the process of figuring out how the universe works um, so that, that's my understanding again um, I'm, I'm not by any means an expert and as Mandeep said um, theorists definitely can give a better answer but uh, I don't know Mandeep do you have anything to add on that? Can I add something because I think it's central when when we say we know that there was a big bang we, we we're tracing back from our time till very close to a zero time. But like I said, there's a Planck time, and that's 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the quote singularity. So we go almost all the way back, right, to a mm -hmm. fraction of a second uh, 
after what would be a singularity, and our theories break down there. We really cannot right now say anything before that time. So I understand, you know, especially if you're an ardent atheist, and, and Hawking is an amazing guy, and you see this, you know, kind of uh, awestruck side in him in the movie, and he's done some amazing work. We might talk about Hawking radiation, which is the stuff that people find most, uh, maybe most compelling and possibly testable in, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but but to sort of think that we can know what the beginning of the universe is, or it's a cyclic universe, or uh, there's a multiverse and there's many things, all of those may uh, potentially be true, but I want to see the, the observational test for them, and we have not any evidence for anything. So for me, it's okay now to say we can look back to 13.7 billion years before now and know, uh, know that entire history amazingly well, and it's an amazing and awesome thing that we have, and we have all this, uh, the equations that, do, that can that predict it, and we can go out and test things. Um, we can also go, you know, huge, large in the universe, and and very small. Uh, so we can sort of, we can do an amazing, amazing things. And to me, that's awesome. And we don't always have to theorize beyond that. We, at some level, I have to be okay with the uncertainty and what we know, and just keep pushing onward. So right. about the call in the background, Katie. Okay. <laughs> I can't help but be reminded of, um, I have a friend who does uh, astro theory and she commented that it's great being a theorist because you get to sit around and dream things up all day and you leave it to the observationalist to figure out if it has any meaning or not. Um. Well, I think, if you don't mind me jumping in for a second, I think the, the thing that physics offers, um, certainly uh, any kind of more human scale uh, science, is that we now know how everything works at the scale that I care about, for example. At the scale of the of the human brain, at the, at the scale of, uh, or if you know you're an engineer and you want to build a computer, you we know the physics for that, right? So, um, you know, thanks, Mandeep, you and you and then and the giants whose shoulders you stand on, <laughs> um, and go ahead and figure out what happened before 10 to the minus 43. But uh, we'll we'll continue to do some neuroscience over here in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate that too, very much so. Um, I would like to keep talking about all of this, but let's go to Interstellar for a little bit. Um, this movie is not up for picture, best picture of the year, um, but it is up for several visual effects awards. It is really stunning because, for one, um, we get to go to other galaxies um, with this film, and it, it seems pretty realistic, kind of, um, especially since we are only theor theorizing about these scenarios at this time. Um, but let's go and speak about, with all of you, um, you know, can we talk about how the scientific knowledge gained from the work of scientists like Turing and Hawking may one day um, help take us to far off galaxies as, as portrayed in this film? Um, well, I'll jump in just with respect to computation. Sorry. I mean, I think it's sort of almost obvious that hardly bears repeating, but, you know, we're, we're um, what what Turing's theory of an, a universal computing machine has allowed us to do is develop these amazing tools that we have that support every single facet of human life and every single facet of scientific exploration, and we're actually even on the cusp of something that I think you know will happen in our lifetimes that will be even greater, which is the capacity of you know machine learning algorithms, certain certain algorithms to um, really massively improve our ability to tackle extremely hard and complicated problems. So um, without these tools that his theories provide us with, we never could contemplate exploration uh, of the uh, universe, let alone of our own planet, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Right. Or, or our own minds. Or our own minds, that's right. Very cool. Okay. And Katie or Mandy? Um, I think I'll say a couple of things. I, you know, what Sean just said before about exploring the mind. Uh, I want to um, make clear a lot of a lot of times physicists think that you know particles. It's all down to particles. And I think I had, I started as a particle physicist, so I've had this feeling at times. But there are things that happen at more complex levels, material science, and then the brain and biology that you can't just do by particles. And I think neuroscience in particular is really, really at an amazing uh, place right now in, in where things are going. Um, I think, well, let me, one idea that you have, 
um, even if we about interstellar travel, it's really actually kind of an amazing thing that even with special relativity, um, if we could make a a ship that can accelerate at one g, just one g steadily, or and what the, what do you mean by one g? Just yeah, one gravity, like uh -huh. the acceleration we feel on Earth. So right, mm -hmm. so if we mm -hmm. Uh, just had something that could do that and then decelerate. Because of the contraction of time, we could get across the galaxy, the galaxy, which is 100, something like 70,000 light years across, in, uh, in 100 years. <laughs> That's a human lifetime. And uh, when I first saw that, it's not a hard calculation. What's that? So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll say, Mandeep, um, uh, for anyone else that's interested, um, uh, the Wikipedia articles on this are pretty cool. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I recently, uh, I think after watching Interstellar, read the Wikipedia article. I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it was something along the lines of, um, uh, you know, uh, interstellar travel at constant acceleration. And there's a wonderful graph on there that shows you, like, how long you constantly accelerate and, and decelerate at 1G and how far you can go. And, man, those distances build up pretty fast. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to know that we can do that. It, th that's not, you know, beyond the physics that we have now. Now, could we, you know, get the rockets to do that? No, you know, and, you know, as people say, if, we, if you go into a mode of dust at that speed, you're going to have some problems. Yeah, I, I hear a single mode of dust is enough to cause, an, you know, a larger explosion than any, you know, atomic bomb ever. So, <laughs> once you're at those speeds, larger than the Falcon 9 that just hit back onto the uh, Elon Musk's barge. But um, that's true. So, but you know, there's there's but there's not like an in principle reason. So that's kind of nice. It's like in theory we could. Um, do stuff like that. The sort of wormhole and the beyond, that's that's physics that we have not mastered yet. People right. want to get theoretically work on that, uh, but uh, we're that's far beyond us right now. Right, okay. Um, I want to just ask you one more question. It's already um, a little past our, um, our, our time, so I'll just ask you this uh, final question. Um, so uh, what do you guys think about um, what it says about our culture? Are we getting more science savvy now that there are not one but two um, pictures up for best picture of the year that are all about science? Are we just getting science savvy or are we just for some reason getting lucky this year? I kind of think we're getting lucky. I, I can't help but think of um, the anti-vax movement that's very it's kind of problematic right now with the recent measles outbreaks and um, it's I, I think that these movies are about really interesting lives and they, they don't really get into the science as much which is partly why we're having the hangout um, mm -hmm. so it's it's hard to know if, if we're really as a culture getting interested in science itself as opposed to uh, maybe the culture around science thinking of the show the Big Bang Theory which is about physicists um, and yeah, it, I don't know if it's about science itself. I'm a little hesitant to say that. Although I wish I wish it was about science itself. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that I agree with you, Katie. But I think there's another um, component, which is the real hunger in the public for understanding what science is, what it means to be a science, how it is that we have the c capacity to do all the all the things that we do. I mean, our lives are so. Um, uh, 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 over overwhelmed with technology all the time, but we're so you know, in, including those of us who are scientists. You know, I don't know how my iPhone works. Uh, we're so <laughs> we're so div divorced from the technology and and science that we experience. There's a real hunger for um, having a relationship there, and I think that you know that's really probably maybe the main reason we're doing this hangout and part of this uh, this uh, Cavalry blog is that we want to somehow help people have a relationship with science. Yeah, I would definitely agree with Sean. I'm, I'm feeling more optimistic. I think there's always been anti-science uh, movements, you know, within every society, and those will continue, but there's certainly segments of the society that perhaps are getting more excited, and our technology allows us to be able to communicate with uh, the, that part of the public better and, and hopefully grow it. Um, so I think that's uh, sort of cool. I would say you know, it's great that these movies are out there. One response I have is, I hope they make some about women scientists. You know, that's something that we're steadily correcting. Katie wrote a blog that mentioned this uh, recently, a blog post, um, that, you know, there's becoming more and more parity, certainly in some subfields. 
And it would be great to see a movie about Marie Curie or something like that, you know, a big movie. Oh, that would so. be a great movie. That would be so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I second that, or third that. <laughs> great. Um, you guys, I, I really appreciate this. It's been fun. I wish we could um, do this more often, and maybe we can in the future. So. Um, if any of your view of our viewers have any questions, you can always tweet us at Oscars Science with a question, or you can also visit our blog at Cur Curious Stardust, which is cavalryblog.org, and comments below this um, webcast. Uh, so um, I'd say we're all pretty interested in seeing who wins at the Oscars this this uh, this year, and I think we all have won a little today. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks for talking, guys. I'm going to get back to my popcorn.